Well, with all of the conflict that's going on, an interesting quote from the US President Joe Biden, who has remarked that Israel needs to observe the laws of war in its conflict with Hamas. So we might ask the question, what are the laws of war? The rules of war, President Biden was referring to, are something known as the International Humanitarian Law, or IHL. And the core of IHL is the Geneva Conventions, a set of rules for war negotiated after World War II. Well, the Reverend Dr. Mark Jury is back with us. He's been writing about the laws of war. Mark Jury is... uh, Mark Jury is the founding director of the Institute for Spiritual Awareness, a fellow at the Middle East Forum and a senior research fellow of the Arthur Jeffrey Centre for the Study of Islam at the Melbourne School of Theology. Mark, a special welcome back to 2020. It's great to be with you again, Neil. Uh, Mark, let's talk about these international humanitarian laws. Um, Do they have any grounding in our Christian thought? Yes, they're based on Augustine's idea of a just war. Um, and so there's a there's an ancient Christian tradition that wars can be just if they meet certain conditions. The cause has to be just. Um, the authority that, that declares the war has to be a recognised authority and the war has to have a rightful attention, for example, to preserve order or, or bring peace. So these are... These, these ideas that Augustine developed have influenced the Western tradition and, and the IHL, the International Humanitarian Law, I think is grounded in, in a Christian understanding of what war is. When we talk about your area of real expertise, and I'd disca- I would uh, describe you as an expert on Islam, but you're talking from a Christian theological perspective, as we've got the context of what's going on between Israel and Hamas, even in this time we're talking right now, is there a way we can talk about those that international humanitarian law and what sort of distinctions there are there so that we can see whether each side seems to aspire to obey those laws? Well, it's, it's very clear that Israel is always judged uh, according to whether it's perceived to follow international humanitarian law. And uh, it, 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 it seeks to follow those laws in general. So it's, for example, one of the principles of IHL is that you would minimise civilian deaths. Uh, if, and if you need, a, need to achieve a military target and civilians will be harmed, then you should weigh up the advantage of that military objective against the likely loss of civilian life. And so it doesn't mean that you, you can't have civilian casualties, but it means that you should always be mindful of the of the need to minimise casualties and not to target um, civilians uh, unnecessarily. Um, Hamas has a completely different set of rules. It, it despises Western rules of law and it has its own rules, which are completely different. And one of the challenges is the international community tends to uh, not to not to really well, the media tends not to pressure Hamas when it's when it's not following the international rules of law, but it does pressure Israel uh, when when it doesn't fo- if if they if people feel it doesn't follow the rules. Is this one of the big challenges in making sense of the conflict and how it's reported that the laws of war are, are judged differently on both sides? I think so. Um, I was just listening to the the ABC recently, and they were reporting about the um, the idea that Hamas had put its control centre under a major hospital, and the the reporter was declaring that um, if that hospital was was bombed by Israel, that would be uh, a war crime. Um, but what was really striking about that is that well, several things. Firstly, the reporter didn't point out that putting a military centre under a hospital was itself a war crime. That is. Hamas had committed a war crime, and sending rockets in every day into civilian settlements in Israel is also a war crime. But you very rarely would hear the ABC speaking about, "Oh, Hamas is committing war crimes by sending rockets in." It'll, it won't won't present that. So there's a there's a, there's like one side is expected to follow the rules of law, and the other, well, we just don't talk about it. The other problem with that report is that the issue is not uh, whether there'd be civilian casualties, but would it be proportionate? Would it be a reasonable military target? 
uh, given the given the humanitarian casualties. So, given the civilian casualties. So, the question is, you know, for example, if if Israel decided to to bomb that site, got you know, it'd be a terrible outcome for for all those civilians, but it might save the Israelis a lot in terms of the lives of their soldiers if they could take out the command center of uh, of Hamas. So. Um, the, 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 media, the way the media reports these issues is really is quite skewed. One of the big problems is, is that Hamas has just complete contempt for the rules of war, and it has its own rules, which are very different. It's guided by Islamic rules of war, which, are, which just have a completely different uh, pattern to them and a different logic to them. How does this apply when you get down to the practicalities, uh, the taking of hostages or prisoners? Uh, you've got two ways of different uh, thinking about law. What does that make? What, what difference does that make in in the sense of what we're observing in the conflict at the present time? Well, it's against the rules of war to take civilians as hostages and to threaten to kill them if you, if you don't get what you want. I mean, that's a war crime in itself. Um, so the whole hostage taking scenario is, um, you know, is, is, is a war crime. It's against the rules of war, but it's very Islamic. Muhammad um, spoke a lot about taking hostages and they could be used in different ways. So they could be enslaved, they could be killed, they could be swapped for money or exchanged for other prisoners. So the idea of, of conducting a raid on the enemy in order to take civilian hostages to win an advantage is, um, is very much within the playbook of Hamas. Uh, another big difference is in the international rules of war, it's forbidden to kill people that you take um, as prisoners of war, soldiers that you take as prisoners of war. But in Islam, it's perfectly permissible. The, the Sharia laws of war um, allow um, Muslim jihadis to to kill um, com- kill men, basically that they that they gain control over through warfare. So. Um, that's a that's a very big difference um, as well. What about the number of civilians uh, who may be killed in conflict uh, if one side is targeting one of the leaders on the other side? Any thoughts here? Well, it's permissible to for civilians to be killed as collateral damage if you're targeting a military target. You're not supposed to. Uh, according to the international humanitarian law, you're not supposed to deliberately target civilians. Um, and you're supposed to weigh up what's the strategic advantage or the military advantage of, of say, killing that leader um, against the, the the harm to civilians. So that's a very difficult thing to weigh up, of course, but that's what Israel has to do. But uh, from the Hamas side, deliberately targeting civilians is not a problem at all. When we talk about these laws, uh, international rules of law, there's a certain sense, isn't there, that in some ways the development of those, based on those Geneva Conventions, was supposed to make it a little bit uh, fair on each side so that uh, each side would actually obey those laws. Uh, What happens when you've got the circumstance we have now where there is a rejection of those laws of war on the Islamic side? Well, it makes for a very unequal war. I mean, this was an issue for, say, American soldiers in Afghanistan. If they were involved in the firefight with the Taliban, for example, um, the Taliban knew that if they if they surrendered at any point, put their hands up and came out, you know, the Americans were not supposed to kill them. They were supposed to keep them safe. But the Americans knew that if they surrendered, they would be killed. Um, so... You have a the, the rules the, the rules are being fought in a different way. One side can take hostages, the other can't. Um, one side can target civilians or doesn't care how many civilians are hurt in an attack. The other side has to weigh it up and minimise civilian, civilian casualties. So it's actually a great handicap on the side that is following or trying to follow international humanitarian law. It's a it's a military disadvantage to be following the laws of war if your enemy is not following them. And it's also, it's a political disadvantage as well, because what happens and what we've seen with Hamas is that the, the international media holds each side to account by different rules. Uh, it, it, it doesn't call out Hamas for committing the war crime of, of shooting rockets next to a hospital or uh, putting a, a command center under a hospital. That's not called a war crime. It, so it's, um, so it's, a, it's psychologically 
uh, the the asymmetry is psychologically advantageous to Hamas. How important is it for us to reflect back on earlier wars, uh, back to World War Two, where uh, there was incendiary bombing raids uh, right across Germany from the Allied forces, or uh, in Japan, the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Uh, when you reflect on those, obviously a lot of civilian casualties there. Was there a breach of this humanitarian law, or uh, is there some way to justify that? Well, some would call the firebombing of Hamburg a war crime by the Allies, and these laws were these rules were introduced after the Second World War, but the Allies deliberately targeted civilian areas and burnt to death hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and they did that because they discovered that when the Germans were bombing London, it was the disruption to the civilian populations that most affected the war effort. A factory could be bombed, they could rebuild the factory. But if if, if all the workers were destroyed or made ha- homeless, then the the you know, the munitions factories would would fail. So, yeah. So the, the the Second World War was won by a total war. They they did everything they they could to defeat the other side and to minimise each side. I mean, the the Allies wanted to minimise their own casualties, so they thought nothing of. Well, they they were willing to kill many Germans, and it was horrific. Um, one of the challenges today is that. Uh, Israel is expected to fight according to rules, not as America or, or, or Britain has fought or Australia in the past, but according to a more pristine standard, while they themselves are being threatened with a genocidal war from Hamas. So it's very difficult for them. You've got a strategy, it would appear, on the Hamas side of uh, these hostages that are being used as bargaining chips, uh, some will say human shields. Um, What are your thoughts here around uh, Sharia law, the law of Islam justifying that, uh, whereas that could never be justified on uh, the side of, say, Israel or any other nation? Yeah, there are many traditions, hadiths they're called, that describe how Muhammad and the early forces took hostages and what they did with them. There is reference to raping um, prisoners of war, enslaving them permanently, selling them, exchanging them for weapons. So this is um, this is part of the tradition of Islamic war. And certainly because of the rules of the war, indeed the Western sensibilities about what war is supposed to be, um, the the uh, Israel is not is, is not in a position to do that, you know, so uh, and they don't want to do that. They don't want to fight like that. Um, so that's, yeah, it's deeply disturbing. I mean, it's, 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 it, Hamas is doing what they believe their understanding their religion has permitted them, even, even though it's horrific. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's a, that's a very asymmetrical situation. Asymmetrical. And uh, interesting to talk about the scenario and people who will want peace in the Middle East will say, uh, well, if one side would lay down their weapons, uh, then uh, there could be peace. Uh, what are your thoughts about the possibilities of laying down of weapons uh, in this circumstance? Well, I'm sure that if Hamas laid down its weapons, there would be peace. I mean, Israel would want to prosecute the the murderers, but um, if Israel laid down its weapons, the bombardments would stop and peace would come. If is sorry, if 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 Hamas lays down its weapons, um, Israel would uh, ush, uh, a peace would result. Let me start again. <laughs> yep. It, if Hamas laid down its weapons, the result would be peace. the The bombardment would stop, and many civilian lives would be saved. If Israel laid down its weapons, there would be a bloody genocide. There would be October the 7th multiplied a thousand times. So that is also the nature of the asymmetry of this situation. One side is fighting to wipe out the other, and and another side is fighting for their own security. Uh, So um, it it is a fact, I think, that Israel is in the situation where it has to defeat Hamas. It has to cause Hamas to surrender or else what happened on October the 7th will be repeated again and again. Uh, One more question before our time is up. Uh, Mark, uh, the thought of what is called a proportionate response, uh, how do you see the proportionate response? What do you think that means in the current circumstance? 
One of the problems is people think of the proportionate response in terms of retaliation or punishment. So, you know, you've killed 10 of ours, so it's proportionate to kill 10 of yours. Um, and they think of Israel as being involved in a kind of punishment of the Gazans for what happened to Israel on October the 7th. That is not the case. Uh, Israel is not trying to use deterrence. It's not trying to say, you hurt us, we're going to hurt you to warn you not to hurt us next time. It's, this isn't a war of deterrence from, deterrence from their side. It's not a uh, retaliation either. It is a war that's attempting to win a victory. And in that context, um, the issue, for example, should you bomb a hospital, is not, um, is this proportionate to what's been done to us? but rather will the inevitable uh, civilian loss of life be proportionate to the military advantage gained by taking out that command centre. And so that's, that's a very different way uh, from how many people think about it. And one of the problems is that um, in the West, many people are thinking, oh, Israel is retaliating. You'll hear the media say that a lot. And I think that's really misleading. They're not retaliating. They're trying to win a war. When, when England bombed... Uh, Dresden, for example, and Hamburg with uh, incendiaries, or when the Brits did that and the Americans, they weren't punishing Germany for daring to bomb England. They were trying to destroy Germany's capacity to make weapons and to fight the war. And so, yeah, there's a, there's such a distortion that's, that happens as to how people think about this conflict. Well, Mark, what is sure is that the deeper this conflict goes, the more lives will be lost. But I want to thank you so much. And uh, for listeners to connect with Mark Jury, uh, you'll be able to find a whole lot of articles uh, that he's written at this sort of depth that you can understand what's happening in the Middle East right now. Mark Jury is the founding director of the Institute for Spiritual Awareness, a fellow at the Middle East Forum and a senior research fellow of the Arthur Jeffrey Centre for the Study of Islam at the Melbourne School of Theology. You can connect with Mark at markjury.com. That's Mark, D-U-R-I-E, markjury.com. Mark, thanks so much for offering your insights today on 2020. Great to be with you, Neil. 